All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those of you who aren't from Centennial, welcome to Centennial. My name is Mr. Robertson. I'm the hospitality and tourism teacher here. Um, for those that are from Centennial, um, welcome. Um, <laughs> so just before we get started off, uh, we have a really great presentation today. Uh, I'm going to ask that you all turn off your cell phones or put them in your bag or your pocket, please. I'm watching. Okay. Um, everyone needs to be mindful and uh, respectful today. Uh, we're really fortunate to have Anna Olson here and uh, talk to us about her career and um, what she does, what she has done, and what she's doing. Um, so we will have an opportunity at the end for questions. Um, so what I'll do is I'll go out into the audience and um, answer questions from or ask questions from the audience and uh, Anna will do her best to uh, answer those questions. Um, what else? So those of you who don't know, Anna Olson is a uh, Canadian chef. Uh, she is known for some of her work on the Food Network, most recently on Iron Chef Canada over uh, the December holidays for the holiday episode. That was the holiday dessert episode. Uh, she's a Welland resident. She is a cookbook author, a television star, and a chef. So uh, Anna's got a presentation for us today. Um, we're going to watch that and uh, listen to Anna, and then we're going to ask some questions, and uh, we'll go from there. So please, cell phones off, and uh, please be mindful and respectful of others in the audience and our guest presenter today. So thank you. Let's all welcome Anna. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Well, this is a bit of a torturous timing because here we are all over the lunchtime and I'm going to spend the next hour talking about food. So if you've had lunch already, good, you'll be set. Otherwise, plan on grabbing a bite to eat afterwards. Uh, it's my privilege and pleasure to be here, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time just sharing with you my culinary journey, because a love of food and cooking has always been a part of my life, but it wasn't an obvious career choice. And my career path has gone down this winding sort of road of intentional decisions and accidental uh, decisions and I wanted to just share a bit about it and I'm just going to get the hang of driving this little slideshow here we go no nope. we're gonna try on the side there we go so the first thing I want to discuss um, are just oh thank you the personal influences because we all have them in our life and who here is in a baking program oh excellent okay I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, and usually, for those who love baking, there is some sort of influence. Uh, a family member, a grandmother, a parent, an aunt, a sister, or even friends that sort of get you in the spirit of it. And for me, that person was my grandmother, who was a professional homemaker. She took care of her family. She made dessert every single night of the week. Strangely, I never saw leftovers growing up. But it was not just the recipes she shared that really inspired for me this interest in cooking and baking particularly. It was the fact that it was how she expressed herself. Uh, she, I, I, I don't know that she even completed high school, but for her, it was how she communicated her love uh, for her family. And it was through the dessert she made particularly that she took most pride and most joy, and she did it well. Now, I will own up to the fact that I learned early on in my life I am not athletically inclined. I was not to be chosen on a basketball team, hockey team. In the, um, when I was growing up, figure skating was the hot thing right now. If you need to Google who Dorothy Hamill is, that's the Dorothy Hamill haircut. She was an Olympic athlete decades ago. Had the haircut, still could not skate. So, when I joined Brownies and Girl Guides after school and all my friends were going after their skating badge, 
I pursued the, it wasn't called the culinary badge at that point, but I pursued the cooking badge. And I, that was my point of pride. Uh, and it also, you know, as you're growing up and looking to those activities you gravitate towards after school, while everyone else was on a sporting team, I would go home and I would cook and I would bake. And that's how I sort of felt who I was and most at home. And then I took that with me, that sort of interest in baking, not as a career, because after high school, uh, I, and like many people, does anyone work in a restaurant on weekends during the summertime? Yeah, I did too. I did Kelsey's. Uh, I did a little, I worked at a little cheese shop. I grew up in Toronto, so I spent a summer working at Center Island, scooping ice cream and flipping burgers at uh, the Center Island Amusement Park. Um, and it didn't occur to me to make a career out of it. So what did I do? I chose to study political science in university because that's just what you do when you don't know what to do. I actually literally flipped open the catalog and picked a major based on what looked interesting and important. Uh, I enjoyed the studies immensely. Uh, I learned critical thinking skills and I've had people ask me, well, you became a professional chef. Do you ever look back on those four years as wasted time that you could have been cooking that much sooner and accelerated your career that much sooner? I don't know that I could have written nine cookbooks without those critical thinking and analytical skills and communication skills that I got from studying political science. Um, but what I can tell you got me through some of those rough exam times and essay due dates was baking. So we had a happy household of um, sweets and some of these recipes I still make to this day. Uh, a blueberry coffee cake is one of them and I used it on my very first episode of Sugar when I was so petrified to be on camera. It was the recipe I chose to make first because I knew it and it was in my heart and I knew it off by heart uh, and because I had been making it for so long it really helped me find my zone on camera my very first day. So here I was with a degree in political science without a use for it. I figured out early on in my uh, studies that I was not cut out to be a lawyer, um, which is what a lot of people do with a political science degree. So I went into banking because through a connection I got a job and I worked for a portfolio management company. So here I was supposed to be reading The Economist magazine, waiting for the housing index numbers to be released at lunch hour on Tuesdays, how exciting. Meanwhile, what I was doing was sneaking out to the St. Lawrence market to buy vegetables I hadn't tried cooking before, like kohlrabi. And has anyone had kohlrabi before? It's a giant round equivalent of a broccoli stem. So to this day, I still have yet to make kohlrabi taste delicious unless you slather it in maple syrup and put lots of bacon with it. It is like a giant broccoli stem. But I, what I would do is buy my groceries at the St. Lawrence Market, sit, sneak them under my desk in my little cubicle and just p wait out the day until I could go home and cook dinner because that was what made me happy. And I did this for a number of years, so I was, developing a career, I was actually moving up the ladder, and I was surrounded by people who loved what they did, and I could tell I wasn't one of them. And so I had one of these moments, and I actually, I call it my muffin epiphany, um, because I'm one of these people who wake up at two in the morning and stew over the past day's problems, and I found myself dwelling over things like currency rates and interest rates and things that I couldn't change or have a singular impact on. And I found myself in the kitchen making banana muffins because it was the one thing that was going to get me to relax and get back to sleep. And I realized at this moment, at 2.10, as I was getting the muffins into the oven, this is what makes me happy. And so even though I had family who were cheering me on with this career path in banking because I was being a professional and I had opportunities ahead of me, I had to break the news to them that what I wanted to do was a complete 90 degree shift in a career path, go back to school, and I wanted to become a chef. And that was actually quite a challenge to do. Um, and because there were, I hadn't, there were no other chefs in the family, no one 
had context of what I intended to do, and I didn't even know if I could explain it properly. What I did do, though, was take advantage of this time to do a little bit of traveling. I happen to be a dual citizen. Um, I was born in the States but grew up in Canada. And so I spent a little time traveling around the States, and I was on the search for a culinary program because we did not have the options that you have now where you can go through apprenticeship level programs. You can do culinary management. You can do night school and concurrent education on weekends and get your culinary degree while working full time. Those options weren't avail available to me at the time. And now living on my own, I had accrued some financial debt going through university. I could not afford to go to school, quit working to go to school full time. So I found a program in the States that was a fast track program that suited my needs in Colorado. And so in the States, it's a little different. Um, you get a, an associate degree in applied science, an actual culinary engineering degree uh, when you study in the United States. It's the exact same programs and skills that you learn here in Canada. It's just a slightly different program. I have written my lead, Red Seal papers here though. Um, and so I found myself in Colorado going to cooking school. I started working around the states. I spent a little time in Texas. I decided after growing up in Canada and then spending a year and a half living in Colorado that my next destination was going to be a warm one. So I spent a year working in New Orleans right in the French Quarter and there I was in a restaurant feeding 500 people a night. I had my head down. I was working 80 hours a week. I was surrounded by people who loved what they did and I fit in because I was one of them. And that passion for cooking and baking just really came to life. And at that point, I thought, well, this is it. I am going to do what I have to do to become executive chef of a restaurant. I hadn't even confirmed if I wanted to be a pastry chef at that point. Um, what I did learn was living in New Orleans on my own is a, a terrifying and limiting experience. It was a dangerous city. I believe it still is. I can't speak to you about it today. Uh, and I was enjoying the work so much, and I had no life outside of it, just because of the simple, the crazy hours you had to work, traveling to and from work was a challenge. So I decided, okay, I need to make a move. And one of the challenging things I found when I had to explain to my family what is different about a culinary field compared to some other more traditional career paths is that moving around early in your career, changing from job to job is actually expected because you develop your culinary personality by working for people you admire and respect. And so you sort of glean the experience you can from each of these locations and you move on to the next one. Take that little pocket of information and go to the next place. And that's how you shape who you are as a cook, a chef, and a professional. Uh, unlike a banking career, which you would stay with one company and work your way up. So here I was, ready to pick up and move, and um, my grandmother, who you saw in the very first slide, lived in Niagara Falls, New York. So I grew up doing the trek from Toronto to Niagara Falls all the time, and on a visit back from New Orleans, I stopped at this really nifty restaurant that had just opened up in the little town of Jordan called Inn on the Twenty, and I was enthralled. Um, I didn't meet the chef, I left a resume, I got a handwritten note because email was not so big right th then, just to date myself even further, uh, and I got a handwritten note saying, sorry, we don't have a job for you, but thanks for applying. And so I stuck it out for a few months later, and then all of a sudden I had had enough, and I decided to pick up and leave, and that very day, it was just fortuitous timing, the phone rang, and didn't I get a phone call with a job opening at on the 20, within a week, I packed my bags, I sent them on uh, all the boxes of my few belongings from New Orleans to Buffalo on a train, and I moved to the beautiful village of Jordan and started working there. And I thought, great, I'm going to do what I want to do, and that's see four full seasons of a Niagara menu, because the theme of this restaurant was cooking with local seasonal ingredients, which is a new, was at the time a very new concept. And I was really being drawn to the pastry sides of things. So I thought, I'm gonna stay for a year and then move on. And I had lined up another job. I was on my way to Atlanta after that. But then life kind of 
does what it does. And that was 22 years ago, and here I am still in Niagara. Um, and so sometimes your personal life choices determine your career path decisions. And so many of you probably know um, Chef Michael and I live around the corner from Notre Dame High School here in Welland. Uh, Michael is a chef professor at Niagara College, so those of you planning a career or culinary um, pursuits at Niagara College might have him as a professor. He does garde manger, mostly cold kitchen preparations, first and second year. Um, and I have loved living in Niagara ever since then. Has everyone here, who here moved to Niagara from somewhere else? Oh, quite a few of you. And then the rest of you are Niagara born and bred. This is a beautiful place to be. You have access to Toronto. Um, you can be in New York City if you really want to in 45 minutes. Um, but you've got access to the big city. But what we have in terms of ingredients is something just so special. And it really speaks to the heart of my culinary philosophy. Now, as you shape your culinary careers, you have this identity that, of your own that grows. The decisions that you make as you grow into your chef role or food-related positions, you have to have this core belief and philosophy that helps you make those decisions. Otherwise, you're lost. I mean, it, it, it applies to anything in life, really. So my core culinary philosophy comes down to one simple word, respect. But that means three different things. And over, as I grew my... Um, culinary path, working in various restaurants, growing into the pastry chef field, I noticed I was drawn to um, restaurants that focused on seasonal local cuisine, um, regional specialties. And so for me, respect means respect in three ways. First, respect for the ingredient, which is easy to do here in Niagara. And when I speak to people in Calgary or Edmonton or Quebec City, it's a very different conversation because we are so lucky that we have, we, we're able to grow peaches here and cherries and apricots and we can actually almost take them for granted. Calgary has 100 frost-free days. They can't even grow tomatoes. So you have to be sensitive about the foods that we have in every region locally. So I just love being here because we can work with the seasons and understanding what it is to cook Canadian means you can cook globally, you can cook any cultural cuisine, but you wanna abide by the seasonal availability of the ingredients to get the best results. In the middle of summer, if you go to the Welland Market on a Saturday and you can buy those bushels of Roma tomatoes for $12 or heirloom tomatoes, respecting the ingredient means knowing that you just simply slice it, you put it on a plate, a little fresh basil, salt, pepper, olive oil, and it's done. You try and do that with a tomato today, you're not going to get the same result. We have some delicious hothouse tomatoes, but really, you're going to have better luck using tin tomatoes in a different preparation that really reflects the season when those tomatoes were picked, processed for you, and there's also an economic balance. So this is where the second element of respect comes in, respect for technique. So knowing how to treat an ingredient when to treat an ingredient as bakers, technique is everything. Because you can't, you can take the same ingredients of butter, sugar, eggs, and flour, and you can make countless different things all simply by the change of percentage and the change of technique. A sponge cake is made by whipping six eggs with 200 grams of flour, uh, sugar, adding 150 grams of flour to it. That's a sponge cake you take a cream cake and all of a sudden you have to take 125 grams of flour, add that same 200 grams of sugar, you add half the amount of eggs, same amount of flour, but the method is completely different and you get a completely different end result. That's, that's the beauty and that's where the power is in a chef, is you control and you master the technique. And once you get the hang of the technique through repetition, patience and practice, you control the recipe and you drive the, the conversation and you have the power to build your own menus originally and creatively and that to me is so exciting. And then thirdly, 
in my culinary philosophy, as it relates to respect, is the most important. And that's respect for people. As a home cook, it's respect, respecting yourself and your friends and family for whom you're cooking. As a professional chef uh, or restaurant owner, it is respect for the customers, the people who are actually paying you money to cook for them, or in the case of a bakery. The, uh, the bakery customers. It also is respect for the people who are part of your process. You're one step in a long chain of people. And when you look back, and we're, again, we're so lucky here in Niagara that we're close to where our food comes from, that we can get to know the people behind it, whether they produce food, like wonderful prosciutto at Niagara Specialties, whether they grow the ingredients, like the Witties at Witty Farms, even something as simple as visiting the Welland Market really inspires and motivates you because you see that this isn't just like going to Zares to buy lettuce that's been put out on display. When you're handing a $5 bill to someone whose fingers are black from sorting or cutting lettuces and, and preparing your food, it really brings it all back full circle to that element of respect. Um, something, oh, hello. Let me go a few slides ahead there. Can I go back? Yes, I can. Um, something that, in addition, as I've done my sort of wacky career path, a travel has always been a, a priority for me. So opportunity doesn't always wait for convenience. Sometimes you can be really bu busy, really stressed, have a lot going on, but when an opportunity finds itself, you have to be, look up now and again to see it, to grab onto it. And travel is something that I always try and keep an eye on. Um, and if you are looking to pursue an actual culinary career in the restaurant and hotel business, even if you have no intention of working in a large hotel, if you are interested in travel, I highly recommend making uh, applying for high-end hotel franchises like Fairmont or Four Seasons. I did Four Seasons for um, a little bit. Uh, Michael and I go to Fairmont Jasper Park Lodge every year and we take two Niagara College students with us. And inevitably at the end of the 10-day uh, stage that they do there, they're offered a job. When you work at a large high-end hotel like that, you get exposure to fine dining, banquet dining, um, you get the specialty restaurants, you have room service, you have weddings and events. You also have a kitchen facility where everything is prepared in-house. They have their own bake shop, even their own confectionery where they make candies, a separate bake uh, butcher shop all on its own. There are very few restaurants that can offer all of this in a singular experience. And when you look at an operation like a Fairmont or a Four Seasons, they have hotel properties around the world. So if you make it known that you're willing to travel, and you'd be surprised how many people don't, but all of a sudden you can find yourself working in Jasper one year, Whistler the next, and then Cayman Islands the next. And all of a sudden, how did I end up in Singapore? Um, and so there are amazing travel opportunities. I've been fortunate that through cookbook writing and television, I've been able to travel a little bit, and I will say yes to everything. Even if I don't recognize it, or it's wiggling on my plate, I will say yes and give it a try. Um, that was actually, that was not wiggling on my plate. Those are lovely little shrimp cups with salad greens in Vietnam. I did want to now spend just a few minutes talking about one um, part of my career. So I guess you would call me an entrepreneur because now I don't follow a traditional Monday to Friday, nine to five week, but I mix up my weeks with a variety of activities. Cookbook writing is an important part of my um, career development. I love writing recipes. In fact, I'm working just now starting on a new cookbook as we speak. I I pulled things out of the oven last night. I was typing recipes this morning. And it's going to be two years before you see this cookbook. It takes two years to write a book. Um, a full year is devoted to the recipe testing process. Um, I develop the recipe. If it's a baking recipe, which tends to be more involved, that can take five to seven tries until I get it to the point where I'm happy with it. 
then I give it to my recipe testers who get no photos and no notes and they have to replicate the recipe. And then they send me photos and a standardized form and we actually see if everything matches. Then the typing and the editing and you submit the recipe and then the second year of cookbook writing is spent doing the photographs, the edits, the graphic design, and the proofreading. And so my flashbacks to political science essays in third year university do come back when you get these giant manuscripts back and you have to have a conversation and you build this trust relation with your, relationship with your editor who is there with the same goal you have to make the best possible book. Um, and it's fascinating. One of my favorite parts though of the job outside of recipe testing are the photographs. So that's a good day at the office. It's kind of a dark picture, but you can't see. We've got a, quite a few um, desserts in there. And so a food photo will normally plan. We shoot everything for my TV shows and cookbooks. I shoot here out of my house. Um, and that's a blackberry white chocolate mousse cake with a pistachio lady fingers. And so a photo like that will probably take an hour to set up in terms of just the photo itself. Um, the recipe itself doesn't start out looking like that. That was the first version <laughs> of that recipe. I knew I wanted a pistachio cake. I knew I wanted a white chocolate and blackberry filling, but I wasn't sure how it was going to come together. And I thought, okay, I want to use the mousse instead of frosting on the outside. And when I put it in the fridge, I knew when I was putting it together, it wasn't going to do what I wanted it to do, but I'm not going to waste food. So I put it in the fridge, half an hour later I go back to open the fridge and this is what I find. That said, something I get asked a lot is what happens to all of the food. Um, oh, hey, hey, hey. Let's go back. Well, what I did was I took that mess of a cake and I dumped it into a pole, put some whipped cream on it and we'll call it trifle. Um, and I served it to guests over the weekend because it was delicious. If I can make it delicious first, then I can make it look good later. Um, but when we're taping our TV shows and when I'm working on food photographs and you're doing 12 photos in a day and you have 12 delicious, beautiful looking desserts, um, friends and family get first pick at it. And it's amazing how many friends I get on photo days. Um, but we will try and donate as much as we could uh, can. The Hope Center here in town takes donations and as well when I'm taping in Toronto we have a few on our crew that volunteer at a local hospice and so everything gets packed up and donated. Nothing gets wasted. Um, there's beautiful scenes you have in cookbooks as you flip through it, often nice kitchen shots and things like that. That's the dining room for our, my Christmas book. That's what you see behind the scenes of that beautiful candlelit scenario. That's my living room because when you're setting up all your props for your food photos, you have to be able to see everything. So everything gets spread out in a single layer on the floor. And then it's pretty natural. The days of cheating on food photos, like fake food, you hear Martha Stewart uses paint on her wedding cakes and fake ice cream is made of shortening and instant mashed potatoes. Well, you don't have to do that anymore. With digital photography, it's so quick. You can shoot ice cream. You just line, set up the shot properly. We try and make use of natural light where it, we can. My little clicker is getting stuck here. Let's go back one more. Oh. I want us to take a look at this shot for a second. So just to give you a little insight in how you set up a food shot, it kind of goes back to art class 101. So first, you need to control and direct the line of vision of the viewer. So see we have the blue pi uh, triangle plate with the point towards you. That's so it's pulling your eye to the bottom of the plate and drawing it up, because I want you to see this dessert and I want you to see the berry base, then that lemony sort of, you can tell it's tart by the shine and the clarity of that lemon, and then that lightly toasted meringue on top. Um, and then we picked the light blue color of the plate intentionally because if you pick white, the blue of the blueberries and blackberries actually reflect black. 
So you need that blue color. Blue is one of the top colors for any food photo. Chocolate looks delicious on blue. Fruit colors look delicious. Lemon looks delicious on it. We also needed to create a color contrast against the meringue. Meringue is one of the tougher things to shoot because it blows out and then you see no depth or character behind it. So that's why we intentionally lit it so it starts dark at the bottom but then lightens a little bit. So you still have some reflective character behind the meringue, but you can actually see it. Um, and then keeping it simple was the theme of this photo. So could I have propped it with a little container of fresh blueberries in the background, or maybe a coffee cup or a water glass and fork and napkin, but all of a sudden it wouldn't, it would have taken your eye away from what I want you to see, which is that sense of the dessert. Um, I've been lucky that in addition to publishing books in Canada, I have three published in Spa uh, Spanish, sold in Spain, Mexico, and South America. So with television, it broaden has broadened my horizons, and I'm still trying to work on my Spanish to this day. Now, food television has been an interesting evolution. I feel very fortunate to have been on the Food Network since its inception. I don't think there are too many that can say that anymore. The very first series you might have seen when you were little was called Sugar, and that was done when uh, cooking shows were a lot less complicated in terms of their production. And we do it in the style that we would do it in a style called live to tape. So what you saw was me on camera the entire time. Nothing is edited afterwards. And so kind of like doing a live news broadcast, I would have someone counting me down the entire time I was doing the recipe because I had six and a half minutes to do every single recipe. So it took a lot of planning. Then we moved into my series Fresh, which showcased the beautiful food of Niagara. We shot it out of my home, which was terribly intrusive. If you ever have that opportunity, don't. <laughs> I, I would not do it again. Um, but this is when television, all of a sudden, we went into 4K, high definition, and television production got more complicated. And so then from there, I went into bake, and now it takes one 12-hour day to shoot a 30-minute instructional cooking video. Because each time I do the recipe, you see a recipe on camera, I am making it three times. The first time I cook the recipe, it's me and the food. That's called the wide. And I just flow through the recipe. If it's chocolate chip cookies, it's going to take me eight minutes. And if it's a triple chocolate mousse cake, it's going to take me a whole lot longer. And I just talk through it the whole time. There is no script. There is no prompt. I do have my food producer who sits between the two cameras. She has the recipe so that if I forget a key ingredient, like the lime zest in my lime custard, she kind of tries to capture my attention so that I can kind of back up and, and do it again. Uh, then we reset. So the flour bins that you see on the show, that where I s scooped out the flour, re refill it, the flour. We fill up the milk pitchers again, put the lemon back on the back counter, and I do the recipe again. This time I kind of mime it because the cameras are just focused on my head and shoulders to capture those talking points that were very important to me about the recipe. So maybe my head was down because I was measuring something when I was talking about lemon zest. So the producer is watching and has me redo all those points looking at the camera because I want to make eye contact with you as I'm cooking through the whole recipe. But I have to be in the same place. So if I was by the stove, talking about lemon zest, but I was over by where my little island of spices talking about fresh nutmeg, I have to be in the right place at the right time. Then the third time I do the recipe is the one that takes, the time that takes the longest, because everything slows right down, the cameras come just about flush with the counter, and they zoom in, microphones are dropped from above, so they're actually right in front of my face, but it's not about me, it's to capture the sound of the food. And this is the close-up pass. So when you're looking at a, a chocolate cake being glazed super up close, or I'm rolling puff pastry right to the camera, and you're seeing how thick it is, that's that close-up pass. And the reason it takes so long is the cameras are so tightly focused on something as small as where an egg is going to drop in a bowl, that if it goes a little to the left or the right, or if I move too quickly, we lose the shot. 
So, and because I can't talk over what I'm doing, I'll have to signpost it. I'll say, okay, I'm about to break three eggs into the bowl. Where are you going to crack the egg? I'm going to crack the egg here. And where's the egg going to fall? Well, I don't know. Gravity is going to determine it. But we try and walk through it. So all of a sudden, breaking three eggs in a bowl can take five minutes. It's kind of crazy. But then when you edit these three passes, we call them, of the recipe into one single segment, what we're doing is creating a cooking experience about five senses when really all we have are two to go on. Because really, food is about all of the senses. And when you watch food on TV or on YouTube, you only have sight and sound. The best senses when it comes to cooking, the sense of texture, smell, and taste, you don't have those. So through the angles and the perspective um, edited together, we're trying to replace that experience. So you can see as I'm folding the melted chocolate into the cream, and you see those swirls of chocolate weave through, and you can anticipate how the smell is, and you can hear how the mousse changes as it's almost completed, that you're getting information and hopefully a little bit hungry at the same time. Um, I feel really lucky to have completed 100 episodes of Bake with Anna Olson. That's, that's been quite the experience. It's sold in 100 and airs in 190 countries worldwide, uh, which thrills me to this day. But now we have a new way to reach people. Linear television, as you know, is quickly changing. Anyone can have a YouTube cooking channel. And so this is how I'm reaching people uh, on a more regular basis. And I'm reaching a different audience. I've never been broadcast in the United States. And most of my YouTube followers are American. So you never know where it's going to go. Um, Keeping people interested on social media is a full-time thing for me. And then finding opportunities. You know, talk about a, an opportunity where it would have been easier to say no than yes was competing on Iron Chef Canada this fall. Um, that is definitely out of my comfort zone. Um, you'll notice I've never judged a cooking show. I've been asked to be a judge on competition shows, but I always see myself as a teacher or a mentor or an encourager. So I didn't want to do a style of TV show where I tell someone that what they're doing is less than acceptable or they sh they're failing. So I've steered clear of it. But when it's Iron Chef and when you get to compete, well, what I realized in competing on Iron Chef is you are 100% competing against yourself. Um, in my getting ready for it, I definitely was. You know, challenging myself. Um, I had the trust in, of my sous chefs, the three of us. We had such a great time. We practiced. Uh, the first question I asked is, is it really an hour? And it is really an hour. There's this big booming voice as you're competing in this giant warehouse kitchen stadium telling you how many minutes you have left. Um, you're allowed time to walk into the kitchen stadium to turn on your ovens, preheat your ovens, turn on your fryer, get the blast chiller going, look at everything that they have in the pantry and the fridge before you start so you're not going in that cold. Um, but what is amazing is through that hour of competing, uh, I knew my competitor, Chef Laura Wright. She was amazing. I had, I had no idea what she was doing. You, the kitchens, what you don't see on camera, are very far apart from each other because the cameras have to get in between. Um, and you're so busy, you only have one hour, that you don't care what your, other, um, your competitor is doing. And then when the judging happens, when you see that on the show, the other chef is not present. So they pull you, whoever is presenting first, and it's a flip of a coin to decide who gets that. The other chef is escorted out of the uh, kitchen stadium while the first chef presents. And then conversely, the other chef leaves when the second chef uh, presents. So you don't even see the other chefs. I didn't see what the other chef made until it was on air in December. Um, so it was pretty crazy. Um, and I think that's it in a nutshell. We've got, how am I for time here? Yeah, good. That's about where I wanted to wrap things up because what I would like to, 
here are questions from you because I gave you a nice little overview of different aspects of the business, um, but I'd love to hear any questions you have related to baking, TV, cookbook writing, other aspects of uh, culinary career, and I won't disappear. So if there's a question you don't want to ask on a microphone, we can have a little chat later. Hello. Hi. I got a question. You know, like the recipe you made, but it turned out to be a disaster of like that mousse. Mm -hmm. Did you add that into your cookbook as something else, or was that scrapped? Well, that's a very good question. the The mess of the cake we consumed as it was as the trifle, but I did ultimately the picture you saw of the pretty sponge cake with the white chocolate and the blackberry layer. By that one took probably about eight tries. I evolved. With each failure comes a lesson. Um, so yeah, the, the trifle didn't make the cut, but I did get to the happier, prettier version of what I wanted. Um, the real ego smasher when it comes to recipe development is the fact that you have to fail to succeed. That if I make something the first time out and I think it's okay, it means either I haven't put enough thought into it or I'm not being critical enough. It, 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 you have to be hypercritical, but at the same time, allow yourself to make the mistakes because the best lessons come from when something gets messed up and you have to figure out how to fix it or how to avoid it next time. What was the longest cook, or what took the longest for which cookbook? Like which one took the longest to make? Oh, that's a good question. I would say my latest release, um, which was a holiday cookbook called Set for the Holidays, that took the longest because it, it was, while the technical book itself was a two-year project, uh, my publisher had been trying to talk me into doing a Christmas book for about five years before then. And it was always in my brain, and I'd always kind of keep an eye on recipes or make a note of something and put it in that file. But you can't just make Christmas traditions come out of nowhere. So I wanted to give myself a good five years to sort of look and build some holiday traditions in addition to, to drawing from it. So that one, that one was a big one. And it was really hard to take Christmas photos in June and September. I, I, when I knew I was doing the Christmas book, um, I ran to Zares on January 2nd to buy all the candy canes on sale because I knew I wouldn't be able to find them in June. You have to kind of hold on to your... Uh, and you'll see me in bulk bar now and again buying excessive Valentine's, Easter, all the seasonal decor. And it, sometimes when you see it in the photo, it's stale because y you can't get it if you're shooting out of season. And most photos are shot out of season. I actually have a question. Okay. Um, how has Instagram influenced the way you market your food and your, uh, your career and uh, everything that you're doing? <sighs> Immensely. Yeah. Um, there are some people who have made their culinary career on Instagram through their photos. I don't want to be defined, though, by something that is, some, that is two-dimensional. I am not two-dimensional, and I find we control, we control what we put out there through Instagram. Um, what can be difficult is receiving the feedback when it's not positive and it does take a bit of a thick skin sometime and also it takes some you, you take a pause and you take a breath if someone decides to be negative which I, I feel lucky that very rarely that happens but if they do that quite often it's just simply a projection of how they have envisioned you and it's not real um, but I do I as a marketing tool it is instant I mean, that's, that's its name. But I love the immediate response. So if I have a new recipe, I don't mind showing my failures on Instagram to show people I'm human. Um, and I don't like it to be overly contrived. And you, if you go on my feed, you'll, you'll find out I'm not a selfie person. Um, it's always pictures of cake and food and bread. <laughs> Uh, hi, Anna. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, thank you so much for spending the time uh, to deliver a great presentation today. Um, I was hoping you can share with the students, when you enter the industry, uh, what did you find most challenging? Um, that's a very good question. I think what surprised me, uh, things that, is, even if you have a part-time job 
through school working in a restaurant business or hospitality in some aspect, when you actually get into the field full, full time and you realize, okay, I work when everybody plays. And so it's about the weekends, it's about evenings or early mornings. You're working at odd times, so early on to find a work-life balance and a social life and interest, hobby, um, hobbies outside of work, that was the, what took me by surprise. I, you've heard notoriously how long hours can be in the restaurant business. Fortunately, things have improved. Um, also, I think what struck me is the, the patience that is required because this is a craft and it takes, especially in baking, I mean, the baker's program is longer than culinary for a reason because it simply takes repetition, practice, and patience to achieve a certain par level. And so I had to kind of take a deep breath and just put my head down and I think that surprised me. With the commitment comes the next steps. Um, but I'd say that, yeah, the work-life balance. I went 10 years before I went to a family wedding once I got into the business because you realize I am working every weekend and mostly in the summer. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the thing you, you have to get used to, I'd say. We've got a question in the back. Are you worried about online recipes compared to traditional cookbooks? Oh, that's a very good question. Yeah, because if you Google best chocolate cake recipe, I think it narrows it down to 22 million. So how are you uh, supposed to know what you're working with? I think just like when you're researching um, facts f to write a paper on anything, you have to know your source. Um, and so there are, this is why some food bloggers do very well because they earn their reputation posting quality recipes. So yes, the internet can be a reliable source, but you do, if you, if you just randomly pick recipes and you don't know the source, you, I, I can at this point, I can look at a recipe and know if it's going to work or not just by its proportions or its method. Um, and it's a difficult business and, it, and this is actually important to anyone interested in writing recipes or publishing a cookbook. You can't copyright a recipe. Um, you have to prove that that recipe, the combination of ingredient and method, has never, ever, ever been done before. And by that point, that if you Google best chocolate cake recipe and you get 22 million options, that is an impossibility and no one would ever hear your case. You would have to prove mostly by method that something has never, ever been done before. What you do copyright as an author is your work as a whole. So a cookbook as a collection of recipes is copywritten and that protects you in some way. Um, and it is, a cookbook is a good credibility builder and there are two ways. If you're interested in self-publishing, there was actually a fantastic article in the Globe and Mail two weeks ago about Greta Podleski, who was one of the co-authors of the book called Looney Spoons. It was it was just hugely popular about a decade ago. And she self-published a book called Yum and Yummer. She has sold 300,000 copies of this book. A bestseller in Canada is considered anything above 10,000 copies. She's huge and she self-publishes. The difference uh, between self-publishing and going through a publisher, there is credibility immediately if you go through a publisher but you have to treat that cookbook as a business pitch. So you have to tell the publisher, what is the cookbook about? Who's going to buy it? Why are people going to want this book? Because they are going to invest in it by hiring the editor, um, going through the process of getting it designed, printed, distributed. They have to store it. They have to get it to Indigo and Amazon and everywhere. So if they're going to take on that investment risk, they have to know you're a reliable investment. If you're self-publishing, well, it's all on you, and yes, you would take more home at the end of the day, but now you're responsible for hiring the editor, and hiring the photographer, and hiring the graphic designer, and where are you going to store those books? In your garage, or your basement, or are you going to hire um, a fulfillment center to ship them out online? So there's a lot more involved, um, and 
the credibility then becomes you have to hire a PR person to promote the book. And if no one knows you, then is that the best place to start? Um, so yeah, that's that. <laughs> I like, I like what the publishers do. We have, you know what, we have a great, for as small as the Canadian publishing business is, because we're a small country, we support Canadian authors. I publish through Penguin Random House. Uh, there are companies like Whitecap, where I first started, that would take a risk on small Canadian authors, and I love that. And there are fantastic grants and tax credits out there if you want to take a project like that on. Um, do you think going down on like a career path in culinary is like harder than like other career paths that you could take? Like, do you think it's harder to make your name? Um, well, I think you've just asked two different questions there. Um, making your name is part one. And the one thing I, I would definitely say is celebrity is not a pursuit. It's not a goal because it's not controlled by you. It's determined by other people. So it's put upon you by others. It can also be taken away by others. So if you're dependent on that, I think you would end up being frustrated. Your credibility, though, however, is 100% in your control. And so any career decisions I've made, even though I have become more in the public light, all my decisions are based on credibility. Um, and you can always look at yourself in the mirror and be proud of what you do, regardless of the career. So to, to complete the first part of your question, it's a different career path, but it's apples and oranges to other career paths. I, I think had I been, it's about the personal commitment. If you're committed to baking, you're passionate about it, you're gonna put that energy into it and you're gonna be prepared to work uh, to see it through to the point of your happiness. If you're not happy, you're not gonna put the energy and commitment. So it really, you know, whether you're going into um, computer game development or to become a lawyer or a firefighter, it's, it's the commitment and the passion and, and committing to your own credibility, I think. All right, at this point, uh, I'm gonna wrap it up for today. So I'd like everybody to give a round of applause for Anna. Thank you Thank for you coming Thank you for your out. time.